All right. Um, like to uh, get us started here. We're probably going to have um, uh, IT come in for some AV technical issues that we're having right now. So I want to at least keep us on time. Uh, for those of you who are new here uh, to this series, my name is uh, Dr. Nicholas Hudson, and I serve as the director of the Office of Student Orientation, Leadership and Engagement. And on behalf of our office, as well as the Office of International Engagement, I'd like to welcome you to the final International Leadership Series lecture for fall 23. Um, we are um, very happy today to continue on this conversation um, around global citizenship as we've done throughout the year. Uh, that's my technical difficulty. Um, just forgot to press the wrong side here. Uh, we tend to base our series off of Oxfam's elements of global citizenship, of which there are seven. Um, including social justice and equity, human rights, sustainable development, peace and conflict, which is our theme for the year, uh, power and governance, identity, and then ultimately, how do we um, look at a world to globalization and interdependence? Our hope is over the course of the series that you develop some of these skill sets as you not only in the classroom, but outside of it. For those of you who are attending either online um, or in person, you all have an opportunity to become an International Leadership Fellow. An International Leadership Fellow attends the series, um, participates in ARC for Social Change in April of 24, and you'll be uh, honored with not only a certificate, but also a medal that we provide that signifies that you are an International Leadership Fellow on behalf of the university. Um, so uh, across the board, we try to make sure that we have some generalized uh, knowledge across the different lectures that we have. So we wanted to set up some knowledge base that we have for folks. Uh, we are defining um, this concept of peace and conflict within the larger context. So how do we define peace? Well, we say that there's two forms of peace. There's positive peace, which is defined as the attitude, institutions, and structures uh, that create and sustain peaceful societies. And then there's negative peace, which is really understood as the absence of violence or fear of violence, right? So it's an absence of it. Positive peace or negative peace. And then what is conflict? Conflict is conceptually defined um, as a form of intense interpersonal and intrapersonal dissonance, whether it's te uh, tension, antagonism, uh, between two or more interdependent parties uh, based on incompatible goals, needs, desires, values, et cetera. So as we look through the lens of the different speakers that we've had and we'll continue to have this fall, we also wanted to have this generalized space as it relates to social justice. Social justice is defined as the inclusion of everyone in the full benefits of society in the cultural, economic, political, and social aspects, right? Um, what is power? So we're talking about different aspects here. What is power? Power is the ability or official authority to decide what is best for others? Who gets access to resources? Who doesn't get access to resources? Things of that nature. And then finally, what is privilege? Well, privilege is unearned access to resources or only really readily available to a certain group of individuals based off their social group membership. So today, um, we're continuing kind of understanding some forms of oppression that take place in our communities. And oppression is a system that maintains advantage and disadvantage based off of social group membership, operates intentionally and unintentionally on different factors, both at a cultural, um, institutional, and individual level. So today we have a Hamas uh, past and future with Dr. Sinoglu, um, who is an associate professor of um, criminal justice here in the Department of Social Sciences. Um, and I'm gonna let him take over the rest of the time, I'll try not to take up too much of their time. Uh, again, if you haven't signed in, please do so to go ahead and get credit. So here we go. Me, I'm gonna, there you go. Okay, cool. Uh, hello, thank you for coming, uh, first of all. Uh, my name is Hussein Sinoglu. I am uh, from Criminal Justice Program here. This is my second year. And uh, my areas of research focuses mainly on terrorism and related topics, concepts, radicalization, uh, uh, collective violence, uh, violent extremism, these types of topics. And uh, uh, 
So far, I have done research on ISIS. I have done research on Al-Qaeda. I have done research on Turkish Hezbollah. Uh, I also have some research on other terrorist groups that I am sure uh, you all are familiar with. Uh, I tend to focus more on radicalization part of this process. Before uh, this uh, appointment, I uh, worked as a senior researcher in uh, some research institutions uh, that were also, uh, you know, the, the, main, the main focus there was also uh, terrorism and radicalization. So I have some uh, extensive experience in, let's say, uh, terrorism and related things. Today, I will be, uh, if you have any questions about me, you can ask now. If not, then I'll start talking about Hamas and how uh, literature sees Hamas. Okay. Oh. Uh, okay. So, uh, well, yeah, over the years, okay, uh, I tend to uh, develop this as a rule of thumb for myself. Whenever I have a topic uh, on my hands to study, a terrorist group, for instance, let's say, I do not uh, choose to focus only on that group at present, okay, here and now, because that would limit the scope, that would limit uh, your research in so many different ways, okay? So I tend to focus uh, on any group that I have studied before. I tend to focus the historical aspect of it first, okay? Uh, because treating terrorist groups uh, in, uh, in uh, as, um, you know, as if they were in a vacuum wouldn't help, right? So you need to also consider environment, you need to consider historical uh, aspect of it, you need to also consider uh, radical, uh, philosophical, geographic, religious, there are so many things actually that you need to consider in your research. So I'm going to be uh, if I can get this work, of course. All right, let's move like this. Okay. Cool. Okay. So I will ask you to bear with me when I give you some information about uh, 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 some historical land uh, my, uh, events, important events, also uh, some. Uh, uh, other related information, let's say. Okay, let's really start with, uh, I'll uh, start my presentation giving you the presentation plan. As you can see, I'll give you some uh, geographical information first, then historical events uh, leading uh, to uh, the uh, current uh, situation that we are in. And I'll also talk about Hamas and uh, it's, I'll give you some general information uh, how it uh, emerged, who founded it, and when, under, under which circumstances, we will be covering some of those also. And uh, I'll also talk about the uh, Hamas's designation as a terrorist group. Uh, there are varying views on that. We will be talking about those as well. And uh, later on, uh, I'll try to uh, build something for us, apparently, and then we'll talk more about the future. So the future, What's waiting for us, okay, in the future about Hamas? So I'll be talking about that as well. And hopefully at the end, we will have a question and answer session where you could ask your questions and uh, I will try to answer those. Okay, so um, I specifically didn't use too much pictures in my presentation because I don't want to address the sentiments. I want to address reason. Okay, so I want to, that's why I uh, abstained from using those and uh, uh, pictures. And uh, also uh, I will give you facts coming from literature. Uh, so uh, please, uh, I also, I'm not, I'm, I will do my best to stay away from politics, to be honest. That's, uh, let's put this out at the beginning. So let's start. Okay, this is uh, the region, Israel. And uh, uh, it is the southeast corner of Mediterranean Sea. There is a sea, Mediterranean Sea right there. And uh, 
there is uh, this river uh, Jordan. Uh, it uh, runs through uh, the eastern border of Israel and oops, it, uh, this is the first time I'm using this, please bear with me also. Uh, okay, so uh, this actually is a country uh, close to New Jersey, okay? So the area it covers is close to New Jersey. And the population is also very close to New Jersey. It's, uh, Israel, the uh, red area here uh, has uh, 9.3 million uh, people that are living there. And these two areas, this is Gaza Strip, that we will be mostly talking about that part. And this is West Bank, so these are uh, the uh, Palestinians, uh, majority of the population here are uh, Palestinians. So they are residing there. In Gaza, the population is 2.2 million. In uh, West Bank, it's 3.2 million. And again, Israel has the population of 9.3 million, I guess. And 2 million Palestinians are also living here in Israel. So in total, as you can see, the populations uh, close to each other, let's say, Palestinians and Israelis. And it's, uh, board, it's bordered, Israel is bordered by uh, Lebanon from north, and uh, from Syria, northeast, and Jordan, uh, east, and Egypt, southeast. So this is the geography part of my presentation. So to give you a perspective where we will be covering today. And uh, let's talk about some history. Okay, there are so many important uh, historical events that we uh, could cover, but the time wouldn't allow. Because this region is one of the oldest regions of Earth. Okay, so you can start uh, talking about uh, is uh, Israel, you can talk about, uh, you can go back to uh, 1000 before common era, and that wouldn't be enough even. So you could also, uh, you know, go back uh, to even, uh, before that. But uh, for the sake of our arguments, I don't want to uh, drown you in historical detail because I'm not also a historian. So I'll be talking about some major landmarks, historical landmarks. And uh, I'll uh, start uh, with uh, 20th century. That would help us better understand what happened before that culminated into what we are going through now. Okay. So uh, uh, in, uh, during World War I, still going on, raging, uh, ferocious, let's say, 1917, uh, United Kingdom uh, well, uh, the Belfort, the Belfort Declaration was uh, announced and in here uh, United Kingdom Kingdom they uh, they uh, proclaimed, proclaimed that they are supporting the uh, Jews to immigrate immigrate to uh, Israel. I'm talking about 1917. Uh, and uh, uh, then uh, the Jews from Europe, Jews from other Arabian, Arab countries or other regions, they started to move uh, to uh, Israel. And apparently that steered something there, right? And uh, later uh, uh, in 1920, if I'm not wrong, uh, the League of Nations, they, uh, uh, they authorized the United Kingdom as the mandate, mandate and power over Palestine. So uh, they uh, took power in 1922 and the British mandate in Palestine lasted until 1948. And, uh, but uh, before uh, their, uh, expir their uh, mandate's expiration, in 1947, UN uh, announced, UN, um, 
uh, announced uh, a resolution saying they are uh, suggesting they are suggesting a two state solution in Israel. One state of Israel independent, the other state of Palestine also independent in 1947. Okay, so uh, that also stirred something because uh, in uh, 1948, uh, because of that, uh, Jewish, uh, the state of Israel, they uh, claimed independent, their independence. And then uh, the uh, Arabs, living Palestinians and uh, neighboring Arabs, apparently, uh, uh, they uh, rejected that. Sorry. Go ahead. So it's going to be 240, so the channel, just in case it, they switch it again. 240, okay. Yes, sir. So I think, I guess I need to hold this. Uh, sorry about this. And uh, later, apparently, uh, right after uh, Israeli's independence, Arab states, am I too loud? Okay. So the uh, Arab states, neighboring Arab states, they invaded uh, Israel. Okay. Egypt from south, and uh, they uh, invaded Gaza Strip, and also a piece of land that stretched down uh, to a Negev, uh, desert here, uh, right until here, and Jordan, it wasn't Jordan back then, it was Transjordan, uh, Kingdom of Transjordan, they invaded West Bank, and uh, also East Jerusalem here, Eastern part of it, so uh, yeah, that's what happened in uh, 1948 through 1949 in the first Arab-Israeli war, okay, so that took place, and after that, what happened Apparently, uh, in here, lots of people were displaced, lots and lots of people, both Jews and Arabs, and uh, the numbers differ. Uh, to be honest, I didn't see a unified, uh, in, you know, the literature didn't, wasn't, you know, giving us an exact number, but uh, it's close to 700,000 Palestinians and more than 200,000 Jews, they were displaced back then. And uh, some of those people and their uh, offsprings are still in refugee camps. Okay, so uh, that's after that. Uh, in 1967, Israel uh, preemptively attacked to rescue those lands from uh, Egypt and also from Jordan and also from Syria because three countries there back then they were in this war and it, the, the war lasted six days and Israel, uh, this is actually the map of that war uh, uh, after uh, you know the, the war, uh, the geography changed dramatically again and uh, Israel uh, it occupied Sinai Peninsula from Egypt <coughs> and West Bank from uh, Jordan and Golan Heights from Syria. And apparently, uh, this also led another uh, displacements, lots of them. So people are always moving, as you can see. They change the place that they are living throughout those time, those time periods. Frequent, frequent time in 1974, uh, another, and 73, I'm sorry, another war record. And that uh, uh, also wasn't a long one. Uh, in the, this time, G Egypt and uh, Syria and also Jordan, they, they wanted to rescue those occupied lands that were uh, taken in the uh, 1967 Six Day War, but uh, it didn't happen. Uh, so, uh, especially uh, that was a flat out uh, uh, victory for uh, Israel. Uh, this part still, uh, Golden Heights are. Uh, uh, under Israeli occupation, and uh, United States recognizes that. Okay, so that's the historical aspect of it. But let's start talking about Hamas. Okay, in 1973, something related happened. Hamas was founded in 1987. But in 1973, okay, Sheikh uh, uh, Ahmed Yassin, Maybe this is the only picture I'm using, by the way. 
so the founder of Hamas, in 1973, uh, he uh, 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 founded uh, Islamic Center in Gaza. This is an organization called Islamic Center in Gaza. Okay, and uh, he is a student of Muslim Brotherhood, so he followed the you know philosophical teachings of Muslim Brotherhood from uh, uh, Egypt. <laughs> And it is basically uh, Islam mixed with political activism. Okay, Muslim Brotherhood in a nutshell. So, uh, yeah, in 1973, he established that organization and uh, he didn't, uh, you know, they didn't uh, engage in military, militant activities or terrorist activities. Uh, and they were mostly, uh, you know, uh, uh, worked as a charity organization. Okay. So uh, in 1987, I know I'm throwing lots of histories, lots of years at you. I am so sorry about that. Uh, but these are important times to learn and understand <laughs> what's going on there, what, what happened before. So that's why I'm talking about those. In 1987, uh, they founded Hamas. And this was the year when the first Intifada began. For those of you who might not be familiar with the term, intifada means to shake and also to revolt. Uh, you know, uh, so intifada, the, uh, the first intifada began in 1987. I'll be talking about that separately, but that's why I don't want to delve too deep into details about that. <laughs> so here, uh, Hamas uh, was founded in 1987 during the first years of the first intifada. And uh, uh, following the teachings of Muslim Brotherhood, and back then, uh, it, I'm not going to say it was allowed by Israelis because uh, Gaza Strip was under control of Israelis back then, but it was seen as an alternative to PLO. PLO is the uh, secular uh, resistance group in Israel back then. Okay, and it was listed as a terrorist group back then, but now, uh, well, it's recognized as the sole representative of, uh, along with Palestinian Authority, National Authority, obviously, uh, representative, uh, international and diplomatic representative of uh, Israel, I mean, uh, Palestine, sorry. Okay, back to Hamas. Okay, so uh, it, it was founded later on, uh, in 1980, until 1987, uh, everything was okay for them. They were working mostly charitable works and religious activities also. So uh, uh, in, uh, in 1987, if I'm not <coughs> 1989, if I'm not wrong, uh, they kidnapped two Israeli soldiers. Okay, and uh, that stirred some echoes apparently, and uh, Israel banned it banned the organization Hamas in 1989. Okay. And uh, uh, if we call the, ph the philosophical uh, teachings of Hamas is again Muslim Brotherhood, similar to Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, the, their first charter stated that Hamas, uh, uh, the first charter, I'm talking about the first charter of Hamas, they uh, published charters for those organizations, stating their goals, st what they are offering, stuff like that in the, those charters. So in the, in the first charter, their goal was uh, listed as destruction of Israel and establishing an independent Palestinian Islamic state instead of that. And their method, the suggested method is uh, uh, resistance and jihad. Okay, on, on the field, we have uh, seen so many uh, suicide bombings, rocket attacks, kidnappings. And uh, I tried to keep numbers, to be honest, when I'm working on this presentation. I lost count of it. Okay. So uh, it's too much. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, so this is what was happening. And I will be giving you some numbers when I, when I start talking about intifadas. Uh, then you'll get the better idea, clear idea about what I'm talking about when I said numbers. 
here. So uh, that's the first years of Hamas. And uh, okay, so apparently the group, uh, you know, captured the attention of the international community. Uh, and uh, along the way, over the years, uh, we saw, witnessed so many differing views about Hamas. Because, you know, like with so many uh, groups, it is really difficult to designate a group as a terrorist group in its entirety. Okay? So international communities struggled with that tremendously. And uh, because on one hand, you are seeing uh, social, religious, charitable activities. And on the other hand, you are seeing something else. Hamas has two wings, one political wing, the other is military. So political wings mostly is doing these charitable works, dealing with you know, uh, the social activities, religious activities, also uh, you know, international relationships as well. But when we uh, start uh, digging deep in uh, the military wings activities, then we see a total uh, different uh, story, okay? So uh, again, totally different ways, but there are four basic ways to see Hamas. The literature suggests those four different ways to see Hamas. If some countries, they uh, designate Hamas as a terrorist group in its entirety, meaning social activities, religious activities, <laughs> charitable activities, uh, along with uh, military activities. Those countries are listed over there, okay? And, uh, or, well, Australia uh, used to uh, only see designated military wing as terrorist group up until recently, to be honest. And then they changed their view and said they, they included political wings activities as well. So Australia, Canada, European Union, Japan, uh, UK, USA, an uh, organization of American states, uh, they uh, designated Hamas as a terrorist group, again, in its entirety, okay? Uh, there is one thing I need to say about EU, uh, and I think it was back in 2014, EU uh, undesignated Hamas, meaning uh, they, uh, stopped listing Hamas as a terrorist group. And then uh, the new review, they reviewed it again. Hamas uh, listed that group, terrorist group again. Hamas uh, rejected and applied uh, for um, a trial. Uh, and uh, the, the highest court in Europe at the end in 2017, they decided they, to designate Hamas as a terrorist group again. Okay. So that's uh, the view uh, of people of the countries in here who uh, see Hamas as a terrorist group. Okay, this will get interesting. Okay, the second part here is uh, they, the countries, they only label Hamas's military wing uh, as terrorist group. Okay, so they apparently uh, do not include political part uh, political activities of Hamas as terrorist groups, and those countries are New Zealand and Paraguay. The third is they are closer to seeing Hamas as a terrorist group, but for some technical or some other reasons, choose not to. And those countries are uh, Brazil uh, uh, and uh, India, Norway, Switzerland. Switzerland and Norway, they are naturally, uh, you know, they do not want to uh, get into these uh, type of um, um, because they, they uh, uh, Switzerland and Norway do not list any country as terrorist groups. Okay, but after the attacks on uh, October seven, they their uh, um, parliaments, uh, especially uh, the federal uh, parliament of Switzerland, federal uh, parliament of Switzerland, they made an announcement saying those activities are terrorist activities, but they cannot. And now Hamas as a terrorist group because of uh, some technicalities, let's say. The fourth one is uh, apparently the last one. They say 
uh, they tend to see Hamas as not a terrorist group. And uh, in here, uh, we see uh, United Nations, Arab League, Organization of Islamic Cooperation, China, Russia, and India. Okay. UN might be, uh, might be interesting because uh, uh, this designated a group as a terrorist group by UN is uh, requires uh, some steps, especially if you are talking about the General Assembly, you need to get uh, at least two thirds of the whole UN uh, member countries, which is about 192 if I'm not wrong. Uh, it was uh, so uh, some countries apparently said applied to uh, for uh, to UN to include Hamas as a terrorist group, but those numbers weren't achieved. Uh, and also, if, if you talk about the UN Security Council, it becomes a totally different story because now we we need to talk about some politics in here. There are 15 countries, 10 uh, temporary, five uh, permanent. <laughs> And in those five, uh, all those five countries, they all have uh, veto power. And those countries include China, Russia, uh, United Kingdom, France, and UK. So uh, as, you, as you might guess, uh, there's always some vetoes in there. So again, uh, UN, uh, and that's how international community sees Hamas. Okay. And... Uh, well, also, especially after October 7th, I'm sure you also saw that some countries, they were more active in supporting Hamas. Uh, and uh, those countries are listed over there. And Iran is maybe, uh, uh, for years, they were supporting Hamas. And uh, financially also, most of the countries listed over there, they do not support Hamas financially, but might, uh, or politically. But Iran is different. And they are uh, supporting Hamas financially. And Afghanistan apparently recently uh, they started supporting Hamas more for certain for the known reason that Taliban took over power over there. Qatar, uh, you know, as a country, they uh, they Hamas's leaders uh, they cannot live in Gaza for known reasons. They are uh, they, in, in Gaza. Israel is frequently, you know. Uh, conducting terrorism operations there. So it's really, it's not safe. So they leave, they left the country for you know, so many years ago. And first they went to Syria and uh, after civil war, uh, civil war broke, they uh, changed their locations to uh, Qatar and uh, also Turkey. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Russia, Yemen and Lebanon are also listed as the countries who are supporting Hamas. Okay, so those countries are supporting, and there are some entities, apparently jihadist groups like ISIS, Al-Qaeda, <laughs> so many others, they also support Hamas for, uh, you know, I'm sure the reasons are uh, guessed by you all, and uh, some, there are some private donors also living in Europe or uh, in uh, other Muslim countries. Uh, they also uh, uh, support Hamas financially, because those operations, uh, in order to uh, conduct, perform those operations, you apparently need uh, financial resources. And uh, the situation in Gaza is not uh, you know, amenable to uh, raise those money. That's why they need extra help. And those help comes from uh, those uh, recent countries. Okay. Now, let's talk about. Uh, uh, let's uh, talk about the first Intifada years. If you remember, Hamas was the founded in 1937. So uh, the first year of uh, the Intifada is also coincides that uh, period. And uh, the, here you can see also the numbers. The first Intifada lasted six years and uh, it left. Uh, the, the total number of people died is actually uh, anyone's guess, but you can only come up with educated numbers, educated guesses, I'm sorry, and it's around uh, 1,200 <laughs> Palestinians and 160 uh, close to it. Uh, Israelis, they were killed in those uh, six years time uh, period, and uh, the first intifada was, can, can be considered peaceful when you, consider, when you compare it with the second one, 
because mostly uh, uh, we saw uh, the uh, occurrences of boycotts, civil disobedience attacks, uh, you know, uh, civilian targets, also civilians were targeted as well. And uh, also we saw so many uh, Israel soldiers kidnapped. Okay. And uh, we saw so many other things, the list is, but the most important thing maybe at this point is in 1992, Hamas decided to establish its military wing. Its military wing, and uh, before that, they, they had it, but now they want to organize, structure it in uh, a manner of uh, like an army. Okay, and the name of that military wing is right here, is the Zetin al Qassam Brigades. And is that in Al Qassam Brigades? Is that in Al Qassam is a person that is highly revered in Palestine? And because of his role in uh, uprising, uh, where in Arab first Arab uprising during a uh, mandatory Palestine, the period. Okay, so uh, what happened along the way? Uh, it's always like this. At the end, Israeli, uh, 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 you know, the, the skirmish, the conflict, the war culminates, uh, it calms down. That's a long way. It calms down. And every party is very of it. Uh, Israelis and Palestinians, they sit together and, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, tr uh, decide on something. Okay, mostly, mostly at the end, Israelis, uh, uh, they release people from uh, prisons because they, uh, there are so many Palestinians uh, in Israeli prisons. Uh, currently, it's 7,000 close to it. And they release that. And mostly, after in, uh, in Intifadas, especially, it, it looks like the victory of Hamas. And that says something, right? So, in here, as you can see, in 1992, Israelis, they exiled. 415 Hamas members to southern Lebanon. At that time, it was under uh, the occupation of Israel. But they gave them the opportunity to uh, meet uh, the Hezbollah there, uh, learn from each other, talk, uh, you know. So, uh, and uh, also at the end, in 1993, uh, the Oslo Accord, and uh, there were mutual uh, letters. Uh, of mutual recognition. So those uh, things, in the end, uh, increased Hamas's popularity. Always, you know, after the first uh, intifada, it happened like it happened that way. And uh, the second intifada, which I'll be talking about next, uh, also will show us a similar pattern. Okay. So uh, uh, so those are the things that happened, but uh, uh, Hamas. Uh, apparently, was not uh, the represent was not seen as a representative of Palestinians, so they were left out during those negotiations. And PLO uh, was the uh, major actor, and uh, that uh, in, uh, peace, that truce in, uh, increased PLO's popularity also. And uh, now PLO is a permanent. Uh, Observer member of UN. Also, it has more than maybe a hundred uh, embassies or representatives foreign, uh, in foreign countries. So uh, it, it, it's uh, like that. And Hamas rejected both Oslo Accord because, again, it's uh, they saw that uh, PLO will uh, be giving concessions. Uh, and that wouldn't work uh, for Palestinian people, so that's why they uh, uh, objected mostly. And uh, uh, it's apparently raised, uh, increased popularity of Hamas and uh, the among Palestinian people, and it continued uh, its operations there and up until uh, the second intifada. But between uh, the first and second intifada, it wasn't a peaceful time. Again, there were uh, you know suicide attacks, uh, and uh, if I counted the numbers again uh, a couple of days ago, and uh, it was like 
more than 300 Israelis were dead, killed, and more than 600 Palestinians also killed along the way. So during, during this truce, uh, peace time, uh, from 1993 to 2000, it's seven years. Okay, so uh, in, in 2000, uh, uh, the pent up feelings uh, needs just a trigger, okay? So those kinds of feelings always needs a trigger, and those tri trigger these, this region is uh, has no shortage of those types of triggers. <laughs> okay, with the first uh, intifada, it was a tragic accident or a deliberate uh, accident, let's say, which caused uh, the uh, uh, the inception of the first intifada, and the second intifada was uh, a similar, uh, you know. Uh, <coughs> Uh, trigger event happened, and uh, that intifada was the deadliest. And as you can see, the, those numbers over there, the numbers uh, are high, higher than the, the, the first one, because uh, with the second intifada, suicide attacks increased dramatically. Okay, and uh, the targets, maybe the first intifada used to be more uh, military uh, personnel was targeted, but with the second one, we saw we, the uh, prevalence of uh, civilians also, they were included in their targets. Like uh, buses, for instance, cafes uh, are no exception, and they were also targeted. That's why we see a huge increase in the amount of casualties. Okay, and the second unit father. And uh, apparently, uh, suicide attack, some uh, in 2004, uh, Yasser Arafat, the uh, president of uh, Palestine, uh, Palestinian Authority, uh, dead. Uh, he was dead. And uh, three months later, uh, you know, they changed the, the Mahmoud Abbas became the president three months later. So in 2004, and still he is the president of Palestine. Okay. Uh, Okay, uh, in uh, 2005, what happened after the Intifada, another concession maybe, the Israelis decided <laughs> to withdraw, you know, in, in, its, in entirety from Gaza. In 2005, Israelis, they were occupying that region up until then. They decided to, after the second Intifada, they decided to withdraw from Gaza. And after that, uh, you know, uh, Gaza uh, is the, uh, increasingly became, uh, how can I say, uh, a region that, uh, you know, there's so many uh, things going on, which I'm not talking about in a minute. Yeah. Okay, so so the, the, what happened next after uh, they decided apparently to have an election in 2005. God, uh, Palestinians, they voted. And uh, here is uh, the uh, result of the, the uh, you know, uh, election, 2006 <coughs> Palestinian legislative election results. Uh, use, as you can see, Hamas uh, uh, received uh, the majority of the votes, and they also won the majority of the seats of the parliament, uh, which is which has two 132 uh, seats. So uh, Hamas became the majority, uh, and uh, Fatah, the, the, the rival, uh, has only 45 states seats, and uh, the others 13 seats, and the others also include uh, independent candidates, and four of those they, uh, they they also supported Hamas. So you can uh, move four of the seats from here to there, which makes it almost uh, 78 seats in the parliament. Okay, so that's, that's uh, you know, election. And uh, after uh, the second <coughs> intifada. So what happened next? Okay, so that's the uh, one million question, one million dollar question. What happened next is interesting because uh, Hamas and PLO, they can't go on, uh, uh, PLO is secular, Hamas is religious. So uh, they uh, see each other as the alternative, just like you can see from the results here, okay? So they see each other as alternative, 
and in 2006 uh, up until 2007, uh, uh, I'm not going to say a civil war, but there was conflict between these two, and Hamas uh, and PLO had to leave Gaza, and they left Gaza and they went to West Bank, and Gaza was left to Hamas. I'm talking about 2007. And uh, now uh, they didn't have any elections after that. So that makes uh, the situation, that means the situation didn't change. So uh, the only authority in, Hamas, in Gaza is Hamas and in West Bank uh, is uh, Fatah. Okay, so Fatah and uh, so this is interesting because uh, the uh, people supported uh, Hamas and put them in the office uh, because again, just like I said before, we're talking about uh, uh, right after Second Intifada. And I already told you that after all these, uh, uh, after any conflict, uh, the popularity of Hamas increases dramatically. Okay. So um, th this is a question. Maybe you might ask yourself uh, at this point why people are supporting Hamas. The quick and <laughs> best and easy answer to that is they don't support Hamas. Okay. So uh, there are so many polls actually, other than this, this election. There were so many polls. Uh, Arab Parameter, for instance, is a trustworthy one. If you want to take a look at it, you can. Our Arab Barometer. Uh, and there are other uh, also um, uh, polling agencies. Uh, some of them are uh, based in Gaza. They also say similar things. Okay, the popularity of Hamas is sometimes drops to ten percent of Palestinians. Sometimes increases up to fifty-three. But uh, uh, so it fluctuates, and it is dependent on uh, the situation, the, the conditions in there. So if there is a crisis and uh, the Hamas is the only player you can count on because there is none, there is no other in Gaza, especially to uh, put your trust in. Okay, so uh, the sorry, and, and also it is the support is dependent on the uh, you know the services you are receiving. This is a critical party. It was elected. They are in power. They run schools, they run hospitals, uh, they run other social services. So you are receiving some services from them. Okay. If you are happy, you support apparently, but if you're not then. But most of Palestinians, I can say that uh, they, uh, according to those polls, I can share you those polls with you. If you just send an email, I can send you those. Uh, they, okay, say uh, they do not approve uh, uh, they do not approve the uh, military uh, activities. They do not approve military activities, most of them, majority of them. Apparently there are some. And those support also depends on the age, depends on the time frame we're talking about. Apparently it's, again, it's uh, fluid fluctuate. But again, uh, just writing off, that's right, just saying that all Palestinians, they do support Hamas is not realistic. Okay. Uh, okay, let's talk about uh, what happened previously and the, uh, the USA's position. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start talking about October 7th from now on, okay, uh, the, the latest attack. But I just gave you a historical background of the total of the picture we are seeing right now. Okay, so uh, along uh, on the background, uh, keep those in mind, and let's talk about uh, the current uh, situation in uh, Israel and Palestine. Okay, so this is USA's position. The uh, State uh, Department Secretary just uh, announced that this is uh, that uh, apparently defending Israel is an essential part of U.S. foreign policy, but at the same time, aiding civilians in Gaza. Also, is USA's uh, one of USA's top priorities there, because uh, the casualties right now is, uh, you know, uh, the latest number was, uh, the latest number uh, of casualties 
if I'm not wrong, uh, 11, no, 12, 1,200 uh, Israelis, they were Jews, they were Jewish people, they were killed. And there's almost like 15,000 Palestinians so far, they were killed. And if I say majority of those are civilians on both sides, that uh, wouldn't be a far-fetched or wrong uh, statement. So uh, civilians are being attacked uh, and the numbers are uh, staggering. Okay, so October 7, what happened, as you might all know, that on that day, uh, it was a Saturday, Sabbath day, resting day for uh, uh, it, it, Israelis, Jewish people. And uh, it, what happened was in, I think it was at 6.30 a.m. in the morning, uh, they started sending ro rockets. And in one day, if I'm not wrong, uh, they sent uh, 3,000 rockets, 3,000, yes. And just in one day, 3,000. And uh, also, please keep in mind that uh, that goes for both parties, to be honest. There is no place for you to run and escape and save yourself. This is a small country, okay? Uh, you know, everybody is living within the range of a rocket, let's say. So you can't know when uh, to get one of those rockets. A close, close by. So, uh, in 3,000 rockets, and after, I think, I believe it's starting with 7.30, 7.40, 7.40 a.m. in the morning, one hour later, uh, cars, <laughs> motorcycles, heavy gliders also, uh, they uh, started crossing the border, and uh, they say about 3,000 uh, uh, Hamas members, they attacked, uh, the numbers again fluctuates. I'm sorry, but I couldn't find uh, uh, the exact numbers because you know it's anybody's guess. They're all guesses. Uh, so they attacked, and in one day they killed twelve thousand people, and uh, eight hundred more than eight hundred of those are civilians. You know, by civilians apparently I mean old, young, female, male, uh, kids, children. You know, everybody. And also, uh, they uh, kidnapped 240 uh, uh, Israelis and, uh, on that day. And, uh, well, this is a tragedy, what happened. Okay. And uh, uh, what happened after that, uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu uh, declared war. Okay. So, uh, they declared war and uh, they started using airstrikes in Gaza, the Israelis, and uh, uh, well, the, now we are, in, I don't know how many, uh, it's like how many, uh, we're in truce at this point, so their uh, attacks are not continuing, uh, but again, the staggering <laughs> numbers of people are dead, and uh, the, uh, this is a tragedy again. So, yeah. as a terrorist, ex a terrorism expert, I can say that this attack is complex, very, very complex, and also very comprehensive. Uh, also, it is uh, it's, it's huge, unprecedented. You can compare it with 9/11, apparently, uh, but 9/11. Uh, you know, it included a uh, limited amount of uh, militias, militants, and terrorists. But this one was different. Why? Because we're talking about uh, the intelligence, the intelligence service of Israel is uh, would uh, you know, normal, nobody would actually guess that these types of planning that took, I'm sure that took months and months uh, would go unnoticed by uh, intelligence agencies, intelligence agencies. So this is also significant in that regard as well. And that also goes for the US, you know. The uh, US is a key player, you know, almost everywhere and there as well. So uh, there are lots of things to learn from this experience, just like we did from 9-11. So, uh, you know, we will study, we will study, we will learn, and we will increase. But, uh, uh, you know, if you approach these types of things uh, as 
you know, um, at this point, I know it's callous for me to say it's a learning experience, but unfortunately, it is. Uh, okay, so uh, this is the this is what happened, and what can I say about the uh, October seventh? Uh, it was significant uh, and in so many different re regards also. Okay, so now Israel uh, is declared war, and uh, they have clear uh, goals in mind. And the <laughs> clear goal is apparently it's been announced. That's why I am trying to share it with you. Uh, uh, the the uh, the goal is to clip military wing of Hamas. Okay, so uh, the uh, Al Qassam brigades. They are after Al Qassam brigades. If they uh, then they want to uh, apparently uh, eliminate key uh, players there, the leaders of it, Muhammad Dave and uh, you know the, the others also. So uh, they are there to finish the Hamas military win. Is it a realistic goal? To be honest, uh, again, my experience says uh, it's very difficult to achieve. Well, uh, some countries achieved that using only military uh, measures to uh, eradicate terrorist groups. Some countries did that, like Sri Lanka, for instance. They uh, eliminated the tunnel tigers <laughs> using only military uh, measures, but it's so unusual. It is so unusual. Okay, so what will happen most probably is Hamas will take on a different shape different uh, and will assume uh, most probably they, the structure will change, that's, that's apparent, but they will keep on uh, their activities, uh, I, am, I am guessing. Because uh, again, decapitating works for some certain groups, but when we talk about uh, jihadist groups or when we talk about religious uh, terrorist groups, it is difficult. Because uh, we did that. ISIS, caliphates, for instance, the last three of them, they were killed. 2019, 2020, and 2021. So each year we killed one of those uh, uh, ISIS leaders, but what happened next, still we, we have uh, ISIS, use, you know, they shift apparently, you know, they change uh, their structure, but they keep on the Al-Qaeda also, <laughs> same. Al Qaeda. Okay, so the leader was killed in 2019, if I'm not wrong, but still, Ayman al Zawahiri, uh, he was killed, but still we have Al Qaeda problem. So it's not uh, a realistic goal. Again, my experience when you're dealing with terrorism uh, so far uh, you know, suggests that you need to include uh, soft measures as well. Okay. So uh, if you see a terrorist, a terrorist group as just like I said, uh, as a military threat, then most probably you, you, you use your military to deal with that threat. And it's not enough because you also need to consider the root causes of terrorism. If you want to eradicate a terrorist group in total, you, you need to do that. I am originally from Turkey. Okay, and uh, I, uh, you know, uh, my dissertation is on uh, radicalization, terrorist identity formation of Turkish Hezbollah. Turkey, my home country, uh, dealt with uh, Turkish Hezbollah back in early 20, 2000s. And uh, if I say they eradicated the group totally, I wouldn't be misleading you. But they used a uh, soft, uh, uh, measures as well. By soft measures, apparently, I mean religious. Uh, uh, you need to take some religious. Uh, uh, if the group is religious, then you also need to include religion uh, and uh, change the narratives of, that, of those groups. Yeah. There are so many things that you need to do. So, social, uh, cultural, uh, economic, geographic, so many things that you need to consider. You need to find the root causes first and treat those root causes. If you don't do that, uh, again, you are killing, decapitating the leaders, you are you know, damaging the group that you see, you think normally that wouldn't come back. It's not, it doesn't work like that. 
Okay, so uh, there are always people who would adhere to the cause, no matter what you do. So that's why I'm saying uh, these attacks, okay, might apparently bring like, several years of truth, okay, several years of peace time, okay, peace in mind for several years, but it's not going to be lasting. So that's why I'm saying you need to consider, the international community actually needs to consider uh, those um, other aspects also. Okay. <clears throat> um, I've covered these, and uh, what we will see most probably in the coming years is we will see a dr drastic change in our policy against terrorism. Okay, because now we are uh, too busy with international politics, like Russia, China, some other countries. But uh, that might also mean that we lost grip uh, when it comes to terrorism. So we need to go back again and rejuvenate, uh, re revise or come back to our focus on uh, terrorism. Okay, so um, uh, uh, most probably we'll see drastic changes again, and we will talk. We will be talking about uh, terrorism-related uh, new uh, policies. We will be talking about those, and we will see an increase uh, both in academia and also in administrative uh, spheres, we will see uh, lots and lots of uh, um, terrorism-related um, uh, studies and research. Okay. okay, so my last remark is, uh, will, we, will, we, will we be seeing, uh, will we see Hamas's next version? Yes, we will see Hamas's next version, most probably after this. It will change, it did, it changed the form. Again, the first charter of that group was uh, <laughs> published in uh, 1988. Uh, they also published another charter in 2017, 2017. So again, charter is the, is the constitution, those groups constitution. So they changed, they shifted. In their current uh, charter, for instance, they apparently uh, maintain their goal of uh, establishing a independent Palestine, but they changed their uh, view on Israel. Now they do not seek the destruction of Israel, but they seek uh, to. They do not apparently uh, recognize Israel as an independent country, but they are after. They are only after you know, establishing their uh, Islamic version of Palestine. And that's it. So they changed, uh, and those terrorist groups, they need to change, they need to adapt to their new uh, environments. And, uh, you know, so we will be most probably seeing a newer version of Hamas the, in the very near future. But I am, I highly and I have some doubts that uh, Hamas uh, will be eradicated I don't think so, unfortunately. Okay, so that's my presentation. Thank you. All right, so we'll go ahead here and uh, open it up for a few questions. We are over time. Please make sure you've signed in. And if you have a chance to wait, we'll hand out the vouchers as well. Right here, yes, go ahead. Is, uh, with regards to those distinctions that you made in the beginning with how this different one? countries oh. consider um, Hamas, India appeared in the third and the fourth, yes. so yes. I was curious about that. And the bigger question that I have is about the scale of the attacks that, or the events in general that have followed October 7th until until this October, we used to think of the numbers of the second intifada as really huge numbers. Right. And now it's gone so much beyond that. So what made that change in scale possible in terms of um, aid from different countries, different terrorist organizations, or oh. you know, on both sides? Right, thank you. Okay. That's really a good question. But first of all, uh, India actually, uh, they 
similar to others. Uh, they uh, uh, they do not list Hamas as a terrorist group. They do not do that, and they're not going to be doing that in the in the future also because uh, of their stance. Uh, and but. I think it was uh, either the president or one of the uh, I, uh, one of the uh, leading politicians recently uh, openly criticized Hamas by saying, "Okay, this is a terrorist activity, and we should be uh, seeing Hamas as a terrorist group." But apparently, for other reasons, uh, political reasons or other reasons, they as a country can, will not be doing that in the near future. That's why I put an asterisk uh, on that, Israel. For the second question, that's uh, actually, uh, yeah, uh, what will happen next? For instance, uh, in, uh, if uh, apparently uh, Israelis' uh, military campaign will last, uh, maybe is anybody's guess, I don't know how long, uh, several weeks or several months, but uh, at the same time, Hamas will be weakened a lot. A lot. And uh, which countries would not want that? Let's think about that. Okay, so uh, it's all, I'm not going to label Hamas as a proxy country, a proxy terrorist group like Hezbollah, but I also mentioned to you at the beginning of my uh, presentation about Iran's position. They do not, they would not want to see Hamas eradicated, uh, in, uh, eradicated totally. So most probably uh, we will, if the crisis keeps going like this at this rate, uh, Hezbollah, uh, is so reluctant at this point because they announced that okay they are supporting it, but they in no way want to you know engage or help Hamas and invade you know or attack Israel from the north. So most probably, if this thing keeps going on at this pace, uh, Iran will start using its proxies in that region. I do not think uh, as a country Iran would want to engage directly because that would uh, bring United States also in the equation, they wouldn't want that. So most probably they'll keep using proxies more directly than before. And we will be seeing most probably Hezbollah uh, on the ground. Also, uh, jihadist terrorist groups wouldn't want, uh, what's called, uh, wouldn't want Hamas eradicated as well. I'm talking about ISIS. Apparently I'm talking about uh, um, Al-Qaeda. And there are so many other uh, religiously motivated terrorist groups also in Palestine. I listed those, counted them before actually during this presentation, and it was 40 uh, in Palestine, there were 40 terrorist groups apart from uh, Hamas. And on a separate note, the suicide bombings that's been going on over there, only 40% of those is committed by Hamas. Yes. That's an interesting number. We would most probably guess Hamas is the leading. So Hamas is leading, so it's not the case actually. So Hamas is not a sole actor, but it's the most powerful, most prominent, ubiquitous actor that we see. But you know, uh, going back to your question, we will most probably start seeing uh, other organizations and other countries. For instance, uh, Qatar, uh, uh, you know, it's no secret that it harbors uh, as Hamas members. Uh, you know, the, the, the leading uh, cadre is there. And Turkey also, again, uh, they, uh, the president recently announced uh, that they do not see Hamas as a terrorist group, but they see Hamas as a freedom fighter. So as freedom fighters. So yeah, uh, recently. And also, uh, on the day of the attack, uh, Hamas leader Haniye was either in uh, Qatar or uh, in Turkey. You know, they're, they're, they're there I saw, you know, both uh, you know, corroborating uh, sources, but I can I can't exactly hundred percent. I'm not exactly hundred percent sure about that. So we will see. We will most probably start seeing. Uh, and organizations, we will we start seeing some countries, uh, you know, rushing aid if uh, need be. Yes. I have a couple of questions, so I'm sorry if I'm uh, taking up the time of anyone else. But do you believe that President Biden is a 
caving to the progressive side of the Democratic Party who may want the uh, Democrats to distance themselves a bit from Israel, not completely abandoning Israel, but um, a little bit just distancing themselves from Israel, considering it's a, a bit controversial for progressives to support Israel and support Palestine because of uh, controversies with the civilian displacements and casualties. Right. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I uh, I really I found I find Biden administration really successful uh, uh, in this crisis uh, because uh, you know protecting Israel. Okay, this is always the high priority. I can understand that because we have history. We have so many things. We have you know uh, interests that coincides and all. But at the same time, there are uh, you have, we also have. Uh, you know, allies, Arab allies in there, and uh, alienating them at this point is not a good strategy, because we have this Russia, we have uh, China, for instance. Okay, so uh, it's always like this: if you alienate uh, your uh, allies, uh, and it's uh, those allies goes some other country. Uh, most probably uh, the Russia at this point. Okay, so as the Russia is always very active uh, in the region. In Syria, they are fighting. They're on the ground. Their soldiers are there in Syria. Okay, so uh, uh, in so many countries that you see the you know conflict of interest with uh, Russia. So if uh, the administration at this point would alleviate, uh, would assume policies. Uh, and risk alienating those Arab allies, most probably in the future, uh, you know, it will be very hard for us to uh, work uh, with those countries because then those countries would, would start working with, uh, with Russia. And uh, uh, that would be uh, detrimental, to be honest. That's why I really find the current administration very successful so far. And I really have uh, high hopes uh, that the USA will uh, play more act active roles, play active roles at this point, yes, but more active roles and would put a halt maybe to this uh, war. Right? Wait, we have a question over here, and it'll be our last question. Uh, so. And talk about Hamas here. Uh, wouldn't it be better to also talk about the Israel and its actions and historically? Because I see as Hamas only reacting to what Israel has done to the Palestinian people on there. And by extension, wouldn't more American involvement only further worsen the situation there? A good question. Okay. Uh, well, that's why I started this presentation with historical, uh, you know, facts, because the situation, the current situation, is the end result of something, of historical uh, events, and I gave you some of those. Okay. So it culminated into this. Uh, so uh, there is no uh, denying that. Okay. But the thing is. Uh, my yardstick always would be, okay, who started it first, okay, who started it, okay, and then uh, did they target their methodology first, later the target, did they target civilians, for instance, you know, in order for me to label one group as terrorist or label an act as a terrorist act, I use these as my yardsticks, right, so again, then, because the other, I'm, I'm not going to say, uh, okay, the uh, uh, Palestinians at this point, they deserve this because they support Hamas. Just like I said before, they do not support Hamas. But, you know, uh, it's always like 10%, 15% of, or 20% of uh, the Palestinians, they support Hamas. Other than the majority, they, they seek a peaceful solutions to them. So you as a group, Hamas knows that, knows this. 
the priorities of their, their people. They know that. But then uh, they act in a way that I really have so diff still actually have difficulties explaining. Why? What are you expecting? Okay, so uh, aren't you supposed to protect your people? Because you are selected, you are elected then in the region, you have the power, uh, administrative power, you, have, you receive majority of the electoral, you know, the, the, in the elections you receive majority of the seats of the parliament also. So uh, that's, I have difficulties in explaining. Okay, then, Apparently, after what happened, you know, now Israel declared war. Am I supporting their activities? They were apparently uh, not because, you know, uh, including the USA at this point, we, uh, you know, uh, he criticized the acts after that. Okay, so, uh, you know, the, the end, uh, at the end, I am coming back to my initial point where I, again, my tweet to my yardstick. Okay, the, uh, um, the initial act defines the following acts. You know, initial act defines it. So uh, the initial uh, attack of Hamas actually, uh, you know, brings about these types of. Uh, I would go back to to the Balfour. Balfour, yes. I'll go back. Balfour. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Outside his Actually, British uh, uh, did a lousy work. Yeah. Okay, I can say that also. How? Because uh, when they, uh, at the end of the mandate in there in 1948, uh, they left the country in a rush without uh, giving the people, uh, how can I say, their lands. If they had draw some borders just like they did with so many other countries you know they didn't draw uh, borders of any borders they just left and uh, that uh, i can say easily because it's already on the literature they said uh, uh, they didn't do a great job let's say there so uh, something happens and, it, and there's a chain reaction apparently but again i would most probably look at who started it Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Thank, thank you so very much. We are at our time um, and greatly appreciate Dr. Smoglu for offering this up. This conversation could continue to go on and it is continuing to go on across the country in colleges uh, and universities across the country. So we see student organizations, faculty on, uh, on multiple sides. And I think the point of the International Leadership Series uh, is to draw not only our own conclusions, about what it means to be a global citizen, but become aware of what's happening, draw your own um, ideas as it relates to these topics, um, while also maybe drawing some analogous um, points, right? When we talk about our last one, where we had talked about the cartels and the US government's uh, desire to knock off the heads of the cartels, there's a similarity in how we treat uh, cartels and terrorist organizations, things of that nature. Uh, and ultimately, um, there's some similarities as we move through uh, with the series uh, in spring semester. We will not have another one of these until February. We hope you all have a wonderful holiday break. Thank you all very much. <laughs>